Welcome to RDT exam prep for Social Studies 30-1 and 30-2. Uh, we will be going through the content of uh, the course and they are both the same, 30-1 and 30-2. The differences will come through the uh, written component, which will be in one of the later PowerPoint videos. My name is Phil Bruno and I will be taking you through these PowerPoints and highlighting the most important pieces of each of the slides and, and where you should be spending time uh, preparing for the diploma exam. There will be slides in the PowerPoint that we don't really need to spend too much time on and I'll, I'll let you know once we uh, get to them. This is an example of one. This is just information from Alberta Education and what they want uh, students in Social 30-1 and 30-2 focusing on all under the uh, related issues uh, in that chart. This slide gives you a breakdown of the diploma exam and as you can see and as I'm sure most of you know already your diploma exam is broken up in both in 30-1 and 30-2 your, your exam is broken up into part A and part B. Part A is the written component and part B is the multiple choice. Your class mark is worth 70% of your overall average and your diploma mark for both courses is worth 30%. If we focus on the 30-1 for a second, you can see here with the written component, there are two assignments. Assignment 1 that we often refer to as a source analysis and assignment 2 that we just refer to as your standard essay. With the source analysis, it makes up about 20% of your diploma mark and the essay is about 30%. The multiple choice then is 50%. So out of that 30%, you have 15 marks that are geared towards the written and 15 marks that are geared towards the multiple choice. Just so you understand the importance of the written component, you can see that if the written component is worth 15 marks, that means that your assignment one, the source analysis, is actually six marks out of the 15 and your essay is nine. And then the multiple choice is all 15 to make up the 30 marks that you need for your diploma exam. On the 30-2 uh, side of it, it's very similar in that the written component is uh, 15 marks and the multiple choice is 15 marks. The biggest difference is that for the written component, the part A of your exam, you will have to do actually three assignments. Assignment 1, Assignment 2, and Assignment 3. Assignment one is worth the least amount of marks and what it uh, combines in, in total out of the 15 written marks, assignment one is worth three marks. Assignment two and three are each worth six marks. So when you see the full marks of the, of the written component, the 15, that is the breakdown of how it works for the written component and then the remaining 15 marks is from the multiple choice to make up the total 30 marks that you need for the diploma exam. All right, and so finally here we have a slide that just shows you, and, and this will appear on the diploma exam as well. It shows you the approximate number of words you suggested for each assignment in 30-1 and 30-2. I always tell my students to not, not worry about this. There is nobody in Edmonton when they mark the diploma exam that counts words or looks at the uh, length of, of the response and that correlates to some kind of grade or mark. Just make sure that when, I'll reiterate this, when we do the, the written component specifically, but you just need to make sure that you answer the questions completely. Don't worry about looking at the word count. It is irrelevant. It's important to note here as well that you have for Social 30-1, you have six hours to complete Part A or the written component. It is an exam that's designed to take three hours, so that includes the double time. You have uh, five hours for the multiple choice, which is designed to be a two and a half hour exam. So uh, as far as the amount of time needed for Social 30-2, we're, we're going to hit that when we specifically look at the 30-2 written component. One thing that I have noticed is that 
the whole course is really about the development of liberalism in society. I have noticed whenever I've done these reviews that people are questioning what is liberalism. Before we go and, and start dissecting the, the content of the course, I just want to make it clear that liberalism is a very big umbrella. It's about the belief of freedoms and rights of individuals. It is not attached to any political party. As you'll see when we go through this, liberalism in fact encompasses multiple ideologies. Multiple ideologies have their foundation based on freedoms and therefore liberalism. What I want to do before we actually get into the content is quickly show you a video that I actually found on the internet and it's it's incredible because it it is exactly the social 30 curriculum. So just watch the video, watch the words that come up, read through the words as as they do come up because it it breaks down the course exactly the way we break it down. We look at political liberalism, economic liberalism and social liberalism. And that's exactly how the video splits up this huge umbrella, this huge concept of the belief of freedoms. So we're going to watch the video and then we're going to get into specific content of the course. So now we can actually start with the content of the course and the first part, which really does look a lot at the perspectives, political structure, and basically an understanding of how ideologies make up the different views and different perspectives in society. So in order to, to fully appreciate and comprehend this, you really have to know and we have to focus in on the main terms here, concept of ideology and then the concepts of individualism and collectivism. So first off, an ideology is just basically a set of beliefs and values about the world that groups of people have that will characterize them into a certain perspective that eventually, as you'll see, we can actually put on a spectrum. So the ideology is based on these core values, these core beliefs that individuals have. The cornerstone that will make up the ideology is essentially based on an individual's perspective on the concepts of individualism and collectivism. We often refer to individualism as some of the characteristics of a liberal society, of a free society. We have to understand that individualism, therefore, makes up the foundation of liberal democracy. And in order to understand what individualism is, we often use a acronym that helps us characterize each of the steps of individual beliefs. And that acronym, I'm sure some have already seen this, is what we refer to as prices. And so prices stands for all these characteristics that are fundamental to individualism. The P stands for private property. All these concepts will come in play as we go through the political and economic spectrum. So the P is for private property. The R is for rule of law. I is individual rights and freedoms. C is competition. E is economic freedom and S is self-interest. Individualism is made up of these characteristics. And these characteristics are nice to have when you are writing a source analysis or an essay, and you can talk about things like the rule of law in society based upon blah, blah, blah. Or you can go ahead and discuss individual rights and freedoms as seen in this society, etc., etc. By using those terms, you are indicating and showing that you understand those characteristics of individualism. On the other hand, as society progresses and moves forward, there tends to be a bit of a balancing act. And so the collectivism, and I'm just going to write it over on the left side of the screen, collectivism is you, can, you the characteristics for collectivism, again, is another acronym that we just call PRINCE. And not as useful as the principles of individualism, but equally important in terms of being able to play these off of one another. 
So that acronym for collectivism, and I'm just going to draw an arrow to show that these are the characteristics of collectivism. That acronym really starts stands for public property. The P is for public property. The R is for responsibility is collective. I is for the interest is collective. N is for the norms are collective. The C is for cooperation. And the E is for economic equality. And so they play off of one another. It's almost like there is a teeter-totter. And we as individuals believe in some facets of individualism and some facets of collectivism. And depending on your ideology, depending on your beliefs of a society, maybe it weighs more one way or maybe it weighs more the other way. And it's based upon how important do you consider these characteristics of individualism and collectivism. And that makes up your ideology. If we start looking at the political spectrum itself, and we can start to incorporate some of the values of this linear characterization of people's ideologies, what we see is this idea of having separating this political spectrum almost into three different areas. And in order to fully understand, appreciate this, you understand that anything that's at the far left or anything at the far right is considered extreme. What they usually have in common, the two extremes, whether it's left or whether it's right, is there's a decision for massive change. You know, a lot of the political spectrum is all about change. What they both want is massive change. And in order to be able to exercise fast, massive change, you usually need some kind of violence or revolution. And that's why they're called extremes. On the left-hand side, the change is what we would consider to be progressive change, to heavily lean on the characteristics of collectivism. On the right extreme right, you have that rapid change, but the change is regressive change. In other words, going back in time and really heavily based on concepts of uh, individualism. The teeter-totter that I was describing in the previous slide happens in this area, the moderate category. And that's where we see all modern liberal democracies falling is in this moderate area. The two extremes are accompanied by authoritarianism. And so what we see is in order to be a liberal democracy, you need to fall in to this moderate area. So adding more to our political spectrum, we now can see that we add ideas and specific terms that indicate where we fall on this spectrum. And again, remember from the previous slide, anything that falls inside the moderate zone is a liberal democracy here. Over here, those that want that fast, progressive change that usually involves some kind of revolution and violence, heavily based on collective values, this group here we would call radicals, the radical left, as Trump likes to say every once in a while. On the far right here, these guys that also want that fast change, but they want the regressive change, go back in history. They like hierarchy. They think there is a level in society of the best people in society and, and those in society that are not deemed necessary. Again, we see on, the, on this extreme right, the violence, and we call these this group reactionaries. Because what they are doing, and the easiest way to understand that, what they're doing is they're reacting 
to the change that this group wants to push for. So as there's a push for change on the left, out comes the birth of individuals that fight against that change. And so they are reacting to the change. And if you think about it, you can't want to change society to go back in time if there was no change to begin with that pushed society progressively forward. So the reactionary group always come afterwards. This is the group that you have looked at in the course that includes individuals like Hitler. They wanted to go back in time. They wanted to have a society that is based on hierarchy. They wanted traditions. They were violent. And so this group here, reactionaries, and this group here, radicals, we often refer to them as the reactionary are fascists and the radicals are communists. Both of them authoritarian, both of them violent, but they want change in the different direction. This one here based heavily on equality, this side here based heavily on pursuing an individual's self-interest. The group in the middle is really the focus of most societies in the world. And they will incorporate pieces of what you see here in the left and what you see here on the right. But they don't go to the extreme. They do not incorporate violence. Everything is about rule of law. Everything is about not behaving in ways and not inciting violence. But they will balance out on the left hand side. They will balance out here. The liberals will balance out more based on things like equality of outcome. On the right hand side, it's more based on equality on, of opportunity. So again, adding even more descriptions for our political spectrum. But you can see as we read through these points, again, anything in that moderate zone between this line and this line, anything here will take depending on where you are on that spectrum, where where you lie on that spectrum, we'll take pieces of what, what is listed here on the left and we'll or, or we'll take pieces of what is here on the right. The point being is if you are a radical, it is full what is here on the left. If you're a reactionary, it's full what is here on the right. But this moderate group understands that there is a balancing act. There is that teeter-totter approach to understanding pieces of individualism and collectivism and how that makes up society. So now we can actually put in specific ideologies based on those previous slides of what is moderate, what is radical. And I always tell students here to make sure that you going into the exam, whether it's the multiple choice or the written, that you have in your head a Coles Notes version of this political spectrum. And what I always recommend as well is to actually write it out before looking at the questions, before getting involved in the exam. You write out a political spectrum and then later when we see the when we look at the economic spectrum, you write out a quick economic spectrum. You might even incorporate those characteristics of individualism say, and you write out those characteristics that we refer to as prices and you have those before actually starting the exam. Because what happens is when, when students start an exam, sometimes you read a question and you, get, you draw that blank. You gotta try to avoid that. And the best way to do it is to have some of these key components written out in front of you so that you will not draw that blank. You will focus in and understand and, and be able to refer back to your, the political spe spectrum that you drew or those concepts of individualism, the characteristics of individualism. If we focus on this, and as I said, I would really encourage you to have a good understanding of a political spectrum because they, it questions will come up both on the multiple choice and the written component. As always, we draw our lines and understand that anything at the outside of these lines is extreme. What I always like to do on both spectrums, political and economic, when we do that later on, 
is always start with the formation of liberalism. This is coming right out of the French Revolution era, uh, a lot of the unification movements that happened in the 1800s and even slipping into the, into the early 1900s. And so if we start there as the starting point, and if you think about it, what did the French Revolution do? It got rid of an absolute monarchy. It installed a system of governing that should be reflective of individuals. It incorporated rule of law with the Declaration of Rights of Man. It incorporated those things and made sure that the individual was taken care of. So that's our starting point. And so I draw on this a little number one. So it starts with what we refer to as classical liberalism. They really don't, classical liberalism, oftentimes today we would call them conservatives. This would be the federal conservative party led by O'Toole or the uh, conservative party led by Jason Kenney in the United States. This is the Republican party. And so what they do is they believe in law and order. They believe in tradition. They don't want to necessarily change society in a progressive way. They rather resist change. But if change must occur, it's going to happen very slowly. But they are very strong in their beliefs of the past or traditions. And so that is born. It flourishing throughout the 1800s and early 1900s. And for various uh, both political and economic reasons, there becomes a resistance, an upheaval to classical liberalism that sees classical liberals as far too engaged in those characteristics of individualism. And what they want is they want to completely, quickly, rapidly change the system to the extreme left. And so this is the group that kind of comes out next. And what do they want? As we said, they want immediate change, which usually in includes violence. They are often referred to as radicals. This is the group that we call communists. They believe in authoritarian rule, in dictatorships. As they emerge, there's a third group that comes out and slightly agrees with the communists, but they don't like the violence. They don't like the revolution. They don't like those principles of uh, uh, hard authoritarianism. They believe that classical liberals are far too strongly based on those characteristics of individualism and they want more equality in society, but they want it through legal ways. This is the third group that comes out, the group that we call socialists. So they want change, progressive, but make note, it's legal. There's no violence, there's no revolution, there's no radical ideas. Everything is based on equality, however. So what we see here is to generate a society that has less diversity in that society, a society where there is far greater emphasis on equality, on collectivism, on those characteristics of collectivism. We looked at this in your course as the case study of Sweden. We also see that in here in Alberta, you could argue that Rachel Notley's NDP would fall in this category. The fourth group that comes out is a, what happens is there's, there's almost a split. There's many people that are classical liberals and they're seeing what's happening here with communists and here with socialists. They don't like the communists because there's far too much violence, but there is some sort of understanding that the society based on classical liberals is too heavily, that teeter-totter swings too much on individualism. And so there needs to be a little bit, not as much as socialism, but a little bit more emphasis on equality. And this is the fourth group that comes out as modern liberals. This would be in Canada, the Liberal Party of Canada. In the United States, this would be the Democrats. Again, they want progressive change through legal methods. And there's a little bit more of an emphasis on equality, 
so you can see the difference between the classical liberals and the modern liberals. The fifth group that comes out essentially looks at all this change, the change of the push for change from the communists, from the socialists, from the modern liberals, and what do they want? They want to go back quickly to the good old days. They want immediate regressive change. And so it's the extreme far right. They are reacting to all of the change that's happened on that left side of the spectrum. And that's why, as we said before, we call this group reactionaries. So these are the fascists. These are the Mussolini's and Hitler's of the world. It is very violent. It's regressive change, go back in time. It is based on authoritarianism. It isn't until later in the 20th century that we see a bit of a pushback. And the final group that comes into play, again, disagrees with all the changes on the left, believes heavily in the characteristics of individualism and self-interest. And this would be the fifth group that comes out the neoconservatives. Neo meaning the new version. So it's the new version of the conservative group. This would be a little bit further right of center conservatives. The Wild Rose Party here in Alberta, prior to them merging, would be considered neoconservatives. We will see this come up quite obviously in the economic spectrum. What you also should attach to these ideologies are the philosophers that would agree or even helped create this uh, these ideologies and so for anything that is considered liberal whether modern or classical we would attach individuals like john locke anything that we would attach hard violent authoritarian type rule not based on the direction of change, but based on the style of government, a dictatorship. Here, dictatorship. Here, dictatorship. Well, what philosopher believes in dictatorship? It would be Hobbes. So Hobbes didn't care if it was extreme left or extreme right. He disliked the concept of dictatorship. For socialists, we have a philosopher that really emphasized the collective good. Of society as a whole not violent not authoritarian just about the collective good and that would be Jean-Jacques Rousseau so he would fall under socialism so now you have these groups that or these individuals that really help develop the ideologies in this political spectrum the last group that we would include in in the development of this is going to be the neoconservatives and what the neoconservatives really are born under the leadership of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. So you have these groups and how they emerged throughout history and these ideologies that really do run the whole span of that political spectrum. And again, remember this is in theory. And we also have to remember division between extremism far left and far right, and everything that is in the middle here considered moderate.